And next up, we have Martin Kletman from the University of Cambridge speaking on the Byzantine eventual consistency and the fundamental limits of peer-to-peer -peer databases. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so my name is Martin Kletman. Um, uh, this is work I've done together with uh, Heidi Howard. Uh, we're both at the University of Cambridge. Um, there's a lot of detail behind this, which is in a paper, which you can find on archive. So I'll just uh, leave the details to that. The problem that I want to talk about today is the problem of assumption of how many nodes are going to be malicious in a Byzantine fault tolerant system. And so generally for Byzantine agreement, the, the model is you have up to F malicious nodes and you need three F plus one nodes in total in order to tolerate those F malicious nodes, uh, which means of course then that you need some measure to prevent Sybil attacks to avoid that limit of F nodes being exceeded, which means then on the other, on the one hand, either you can have the permission blockchain approach where you have centralized control over the number of nodes in the system, or you can use some kind of finite resource uh, like proof of work uh, in order to uh, avoid the civil attacks. Now, um, for me personally, uh, there are not enough uh, sad faces in the world to yeah. express how I feel about proof of work. Um, but I can see the, the need for wanting a permissionless system. And so this has led us to asking, OK, so we know that for Byzantine agreement, if you exceed the number of uh, F faulty nodes, then basically all bets are off. The algorithm cannot guarantee any safety properties or any liveness properties. It simply weird stuff can happen. But maybe there are some types of application in which actually you can tolerate any number of malicious nodes. So we don't need to assume that less than one third of the node is faulty. We don't need, even need to assume a 51% or anything like that. Maybe for some applications, it's okay to have arbitrary numbers of malicious nodes and still get the job done. Now, this won't be arbitrary cryptocurrencies or things like that. They clearly need this limit, but uh, it would be really nice if we can characterize exactly which applications can tolerate arbitrary numbers of malicious nodes because they then don't need simple attack uh, countermeasures. They don't need any sort of voting. They don't need any sort of proof of work. So what we would like is imagine the space of all possible applications that people might build. We want to figure out where's that dividing line between the set of applications that require the three F plus one and that require the civil countermeasures and the types of applications that do not require civil countermeasures because they can tolerate any number of malicious nodes. And so drawing that dividing line is, is the purpose of this work. And we're going to uh, introduce this term of Byzantine eventual consistency for the types of applications uh, that can tolerate any number of Byzantine faulty nodes. And Byzantine eventual consistency, we can define in terms of a couple of properties. Uh, one is a simple liveness property. That is, if one correct replica applies an update, then eventually all of the correct replicas will apply that update. Um, second property that we can require is convergence. And that is, if you've got any two replicas that have seen the same set of updates, then they must be in the same state. Uh, that can be achieved, for example, using CRDTs. I'm not going to talk about those in this talk, um, but there's a lot of existing work on that, which also Victor mentioned briefly just now. And uh, finally, we can talk about invariants about the data, and I'll explain in a moment what I mean with that. Um, there are also a couple of more technical properties uh, that I haven't put on the slide here, but you can find in the paper. But crucially, we want to ensure that these properties hold regardless of the number of malicious nodes in the system. So this idea of an invariant here is quite an important one. So an invariant, what I mean, is a function that takes conceptually the entire state of a replica and it returns either true or false, depending on whether the invariant is satisfied or not. And so typical invariants might be stuff like every account has a non-negative balance. Uh, that is essentially the uh, double spending prevention that you need in any cryptocurrency. Um, that is, uh, you can't spend more money than you have. And, um, and so that is one particular example of an invariant. But you can ma imagine many other invariants. So if you think about this in database terms, then, for example, a foreign key constraint in a database is, is a type of invariant that may or may not be satisfied, or a uniqueness constraint uh, on a particular value. So if you want a particular username to be unique, for example, um, 
or a domain name and the domain name system which should be unique and so on, um, then uh, that again is a type of invariant. And we can now reason about whether an invariant is confluent or not. And so I'll explain what I mean with confluence. So imagine you have two replicas, A and B, they're both initially in the state S and the invariant I is satisfied for both, uh, for both replicas. Now the replica A performs some update U1 and moves into state SA. And we are going to assume that SA uh, still satisfies the invariant. Moreover, in, concurrently to that, the replica B is going to apply some different update U2. And we're going to assume that in the state SB, the invariant is also satisfied. So under all of those assumptions, we're going to say the two replicas now exchange their updates. They both merge them into some state. And based on the convergence property earlier, we know that this merge is always possible. And if the invariant is still satisfied in this merged state, then we say that the updates u1, u2 are invariant confluent with regard to the invariant i. Now, this may seem a bit technical, but I'll give you an example. So let's say that our invariant is that we want no negative account balances in the system. And the two updates are updates that decrease the balance of the same account. Well, then it could happen that each update individually is safe. So each update individually reduces the, the balance only to some non-negative value. But if you take both of the updates combined, that would cause the balance to go negative. And so in that merged state, then the uh, invariant would no longer be satisfied. And therefore, these two updates are not invariant confluent with respect to i. However, if we change it instead so that the, the two updates actually increase the balance of some account, then it's perfectly fine to perform those two updates independently from each other. And we know that we can always merge them together and we will never end up with a negative account balance because the only thing that, the, um, that ha can happen to the account balance is to increase, assume we don't have any overflow. And so in this case, uh, U1 and U2 are invariant confluent with respect to I. What we did is to prove now that using this definition of invariant confluence, um, it's actually possible to ensure Byzantine cons eventual consistency with an arbitrary number of malicious uh, replicas if and only if all of the updates are invariant confluent with respect to all of the invariants of the system. And this now tells you why a cryptocurrency is uh, not invariant, uh, well, not amenable to Byzantine eventual consistency because you have this double spending prevention that you need to do. Um, and so that makes it not invariant confluent. But there is a large class of other types of applications that are still useful apps that are actually invariant confluent and which we can therefore implement in this model where we have arbitrary number of Byzantine 40 replicas. So I find that quite exciting. Now, I'd like to show you briefly also an algorithm for actually implementing uh, Byzantine eventual consistency. And the idea here is that you've, you've got any number of replicas and they can connect to each other pairwise, and they need to figure out in this pairwise communication what updates do they need to send to each other so that at the end they both have the same set of updates. So let's say we have replicas A and B here. They, A starts off with updates U1 and U2, uh, B starts with updates U1, U3, and what we want is now that uh, A is going to send U2 to B and B is going to send U3 to A, and then they will have both have the same set of updates. Um, but we need to ensure that um, this protocol for exchanging the updates is resilient to any Byzantine faulty replicas that might be there. And so one thing we might do, for example, is to make one update depend on each other, on, on another update. And whenever uh, a later update depends on an earlier one, we include a hash of the earlier update in the uh, data of the later update. And this will give you a hashtag, just like in Git or IPLD or a million other systems that all use hash graphs. Um, but then this now has the nice property that in order to represent the set of updates that you have, you only need to find the heads of this graph, that is the, the updates that have no other updates depending on them. And you can just send the hashes of those over the network. And uh, that, is, that encodes already the information of what updates you have. And based on that, now the nodes can figure out whether they're in the same state or not. So if the hashes are the same, we know that the 
the uh, two nodes must be in the same state. They must have the same set of updates. The difficulty now, the annoying thing, is that if the hashes are not the same, you have to walk backwards in this graph until you find the, the common ancestor where the, uh, the hashes are known to the other side. And that involves a lot of round trips back and forth uh, as you go step by step backwards in this hash graph. And if your hash graphs are very long, this becomes very slow. And so we now developed uh, an optimized algorithm which can sync up these hash graphs very efficiently, uh, usually in just a single round trip. Uh, occasionally, it can require more round trips uh, with a small probability. And the idea for this is like this. So we assume that uh, the two replicas have some part of their hash graph in common, and then some other part of the hash graph was added since their last sync. And they can remember what the state, what the outcome was of the last sync. So A remembers the last time I talked to B, this was the, the hashes that were the heads of the graph at the time of my last sync with B. And likewise, B can remember what the hashes were at the last sync with A. And from those remembering those hashes, they can now work out what are all of the updates that were added to this hash graph since the last sync between these two nodes. We can now identify exactly which subgraph of the, uh, uh, of the hash graph was added. And well, one option would be to simply send everything that was added since last time, but actually the nodes might have got part of that graph from some other node uh, because there are lots of nodes all syncing pairwise. So actually we want to figure out only which parts of those which of those parts of the graph that were added have are not yet known to the other side, so that we don't end up sending updates unnecessarily that the recipient already has. And there's a fairly simple trick we can use actually to do that uh, using Bloom filters. So Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure for encoding a set, um, and we can take the set of hashes that were added since the last sync and put those into a Bloom filter, which is a fairly compact. Uh, byte array re representation essentially, and send those bloom filters over the network to the other side. And those will allow the other side to figure out exactly which changes I have, which the other node does not have, and those they will then send to each other. And this provides us a, a really efficient way of syncing up two nodes. And it has the nice property also that it is uh, resilient so that if some of the replicas in the system are Byzantine faulty, they can't cause other nodes to go out of sync with each other, for example. So the whole thing is uh, resilient and it achieves Byzantine eventual consistency in a system with arbitrarily many uh, malicious nodes. Uh, we have implemented this algorithm in a CRDT library that I work on called AutoMerge. Um, there's also a blog post on, the, uh, on this hash graph reconciliation algorithm if you're interested in that and of course the paper, as I mentioned. So uh, that's all from me. Happy to take any questions.